It's January 27th, 1687, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Antiquity, tis owned, does well deserve profound respect, yet not to be adored. The ancients I with unbent knee behold, for they, though great, were men as well as we. The opening lines of Charles Perrault's poem, The Age of Louis the Great, which he read out on this day at the Académie Française, attempting to finally settle that age-old debate, what was better, the thens or the nows? And the poem kicked off an episode that became known as La Quarelle that lasted from 1687 to 1694. So a good long time. I've had rows like that. (laughs) (laughs) But it was the clash between the ancients and the moderns. And uh, they were represented on one side by Perrault and on the other side, Nicolas Boileau. And each of them took a very firm position. The ancients, led by Boileau, said that literary creation has its roots in an understanding of antiquity. So old stuff. We have to appreciate the old stuff before we can actually get our heads around new stuff. And the moderns thought that since France, and Louis XIV in particular, surpassed all other states in all history in terms of its political and religious perfection and so on, it follows that the work that was being created at this time, literary, artistic and so on, was better than anything the ancients had come up with. And this was the, <laughs> this major clash represented by the poem that was read out on this day at the Academy. Ollie, you're shaking your head. (laughs) This is the problem, isn't it, with the establishment consisting of people that have been educated to the highest level. You know, I'm glad that we've moved slightly beyond this now, because this is an interesting thing to look into, isn't it? This intellectual debate that was happening in 1687. But isn't it so bizarre that this is considered to be one of the important historical events that was happening in 1687, whereas actually it's just some educated people standing around having an artistic debate which to use a classical illusion that they would appreciate, is a Trojan horse in itself, isn't it? Like, what's better, the thens or the nows? Why ask? Why does it matter? I I think we should probably explain, first of all, what the French Academy was. The French Academy was founded in 1648 under King Louis XIV, and nowadays it's part of the Académie de Beaux-Arts, so it includes disciplines like architecture and choreography. It has modernised. But then... It was the national institution that oversaw the training of artists as well as set artistic standards for France. So it wasn't just that they were standing around talking about which was better, you know, Homer or Racine, although that is what they were effectively doing. They were doing it Hmm. to decide who should get the money for the future, who should be invested in by the state, what would be considered art in the future, what French art was allowed to look like. Yeah, and this was a turning point moment across Europe where the question was, what should we be doing with the vernacular languages? Because prior to the medieval times, all of the intellectual people would have been writing in Latin or maybe Greek. And there was no question that the vernacular languages, so, you know, French, Spanish, English, they were suitable for the lower classes, but they weren't suitable for creating really highbrow works of intellectual perfection in the model of the Greeks and Romans. But by this time, there was a lot more literature being produced in those vernacular languages. And the question was, what's the best way for the languages to go forward? Should we be trying to imitate the forms and style of Latin and Greek in our languages, or should we be doing our own thing? And that was sort of what lay at the very root of this, what was called the querelle, the quarrel, was what is an appropriate way to use your language? And from the point of view of the ancients, the best thing that French could do was try as closely as possible to imitate the form and style of Latin or Greek, Whereas the moderns were a bit more... They, to be fair, though, you've got to keep in mind that the moderns also loved antiquity and loved Latin and Greek, mm. and they had all been educated in this classical curriculum that was almost entirely based on learning Latin and reading Latin classics. So mm. there was no faction that was saying, you know, the ancients sucked. They no. were just saying, <laughs> the ancients were great, but it's OK for us to do our own thing too because we've created this fantastic society. Well, there was an element of the ancients were great, but we're better, though, wasn't there? That was the controversial bit. Pero was basically saying in his poem, look, Homer's great, but the telescope is better than Aristotle. And Homer was a bad astronomer, if you read the detail, because obviously because he was guessing. That was his point, wasn't it? I mean, it seems entirely uncontroversial now, like obviously. But then it seemed a provocative thing to say. Yes, but I mean, it also was a bit of a stand-in for 
the clash of democracy on one hand and absolute monarchy on the other. And if you read the rest of the poem that Perrault wrote and presented on this day... What more than the opening couplet? It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that bit's great. Um, <laughs> but it goes I feel like on I know the whole on. thing. I've heard his opening <laughs> statements. <laughs> I must say, I couldn't find a version of it in English because it's, it's pretty woeful stuff, so I had to go to the French and use <laughs> Google Translate. But it's just so ass-kissy of Louis XIV. And it has this chunk that's about the invincible Louis without a fleet, without an army, let only his fame act in all these places around the world. And people charmed by his various exploits cross without rest the vast bosom of the seas to come to his feet and pay him humble homage. I mean, it's just all about how great he is. And I think that's the thing that the ancients objected to in this sort of proxy, let's actually be talking about literature way, that they're talking about the greatness of democracy. So it kind of prefigures in a you know, in a, in a way, the coming of the French Revolution, though, you know, still that's a long way out. And at the height of the row, Perrault and his brother Claude tried to have Boileau charged with Les Majestés in insulting the king, which used to be a criminal yeah. offence, on the grounds that he preferred the works of these pagan ancients to the work created under Louis XIV's perfect Catholic monarchy. It was an incredibly personal <laughs> row as well. One reason being that as a child, Boileau had been a patient of Claude Perrault, Perrault's brother, who was a doctor and an architect it doesn't seem like a great combination to be outstanding at both of those things and he found his care lacking Wallow's sister was also under his care and died so he had a real hatred for the Perros in general and I think Perro felt an obligation to the king as well because the king had supported his elevation to the academy in the first place and I wonder if that was like bearing in mind the king established the academy as I suggested <laughs> whether that was slightly done with a nudge and a wink to like can you be my voice please in this environment which is full of all these people that talk about Homer all the time just because I'm a little bit threatened by this and Perrault would have been a good choice from that perspective because he was a man of letters he was a literary man he went on to write a whole load of stuff he was a student of classical literature but also he was just a massive fluffer for the king so he um, <laughs> helped Louis the Fourteenth design the gardens at Versailles um, yeah. And it's because of Perrault's interventions and his interest in literature that uh, the gardens there have 39 fountains, each representing one of the fables of Aesop. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. And I am now <laughs> counting what I have in my house that I have 39 of so that I can do the same. <laughs> and I'll pretend. Yeah, we've got 39 uh, rocks in our rockery. That's in tribute to the fables of Aesop. <laughs> just, just give, you've got 39 spices in the cupboard. That could be the reason. <laughs> classical rules were so incredibly restrictive and strict mm. I think it's you know obviously we're so far removed from this era now that it, it that it's easy to overlook this but people like Aristotle had left behind very precise manifestos of exactly what plays and poems should look like and that was what mm. was still being expected by the Académie Française one of the early forerunners of this debate was Pierre Cornet's play Le Cid about El Cid, the Spanish hero. And it sparked a huge debate because although he technically did adhere to the rules, the main rules were unity of time, it had to take place in a 24-hour period, unity of place, all in one location, and unity of action, so no subplots. And can you imagine what our theatre would look like now if we had to stick by those rules? (laughs) And Cornet did (laughs) technically stick to them because of the huge controversy over his play. He actually wrote a whole sort of manifesto, point by point, saying, look, I have stuck to all of these rules, but it did strain the credibility of the events to have so much happening in 24 hours. And he kind of was like, yeah, like kind of like, yes, guys, it does. Maybe we shouldn't have to do that, but I did do it. (laughs) What really caused controversy, though, was that he had departed from the rules of classical tragedy because he had his characters acting in basically what we would recognise as a realistic human way. But in classical Mm. Greek tragedy, you had to act with decorum. Characters had to act in what was considered to be in accordance with their position and the right way for them to react. And in Le Cid, you had a heroine who fell in love with her father's killer. And Corneille wrote, well, basically, this is what happened in real life. There's historical accounts. This is how it was. And the Académie Française responded to that by saying, there are monstrous truths which must be repressed for the good of society. In these cases, the poet should prefer verisimilitude to truth. Hmm i.e. it's better to have your characters act in a noble way on stage, even if that wasn't what happened in real life. So it was an incredibly repressive way of seeing, you know, the human experience. Yeah, if you ever do see any ancient Greek theatre, it now looks ancient for a reason. Like the whole business of having a chorus 
in the first place, like this sort of this group of people kind of narrating the story in unison, like it's the most absurd thing. It's really hard to focus on the narrative. And if you tried to adhere to those rules in a contemporary setting, you'd be left pretty much with something like the mousetrap. <laughs> you know, it's just like <laughs> something where all the characters walk onto a single set and in the course of a thing, they resolve a thing. You know, that's like you've, you've just got Agatha Christie and maybe some sort of sitcoms. That's what you've got. Well, whereas we know that the ultimate structure for all good storytelling is of course a tight 10 minutes that ends on a laugh <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> tomorrow they have a different number of tubes but those tubes actually allow for the studs on top to make more contact love the show support the show patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the ACAS creator network